Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last Wednesday webinar of the year from the Pitt University Network, or Pitt UN, as we call it, here at New America. My name is Alberto Rodriguez, and I'm a senior pro program manager at the New Practice Lab and the, and the Pitt University Network, and I'll be facilitating this conversation today. As you know, Pitt UN unites colleges and universities committed to building the field of public interest technology and growing a new generation of civic minded technologists. Uh, these webinars are just one of the ways we elevate the work of researchers to both our members and everyone interested. Um, emerging technologies are changing every aspect of our lives, from how we communicate with each other, particularly in this pandemic, and how we are shaping our future. And for the last year, a team of researchers affiliated with Civic Hall and the Design Justice Project have been working to understand the nature of how these technologies might allow us to live with a degree of safety from, the, from COVID and other viruses, and how can we ensure that technologies do not in, unintentionally reinforce racial and structural inequalities. So after an in-depth literature review, 40, no, 20, 20 something field leader interviews and a database of more than 250 relevant sources, they published the report Pathways Through the Portal a field scan of emerging technologies in the public interest, from which we're going to hear all about today. Our conversation will be really straightforward. First, we're going to uh, hear from the authors about the main insights of the report and the recommendations to design and, and, and to use emerging technologies in the public sphere. Uh, and they will also be sharing some link in our Q&A, so keep posted on that. And after that presentation, I will be asking some questions to our panelists source from you, our audience. So please join the conversation by making comments or, uh, and adding questions to your Q&A. Um, and on at the end, we'll try to address them. Before we start, let me quickly introduce our authors and our panelists today. I'll start with uh, Diana Nuceta, she, or AKA Mother Cyborg. She's an, an artist, educator, and community organizer who explores in, innovative technology with communities most impacted by digital inequalities. Her specialty is developing popular education experiences, supported by dynamic documentation that empower communities to use media and technology as visionary tools. She has been working as a media artist and a technology educator for the past 16 years. Uh, Berhan Taye is a researcher who investigates the relationship between technology, society, and social justice right in, the, in, in our alley here at Pitt UN. She is a senior policy analyst and, and global internet shutdowns lead at Access Now. Before that, she was a, a Ford Mozilla Open Web Fellow with Research Action Design at the Open Technology Institute. Um, Sasha Costanza Chuck is a researcher and designer who is known for, for their work in network social movements, transformative media organizing, and design justice. Uh, Sasha is a research scientist at MIT and the author of two books and numerous journal articles, book chapters, and other research publications. Matt Stempek is a senior researcher at Civic Hall and a curator of the Civic Tech Field Guide, a crowdsourced global directory of nearly 4,000 tech for public good projects and he holds a master's of science from MIT and a BA from University of Maryland College Park. And lastly, but not least, uh, Micha Sifrai, president and co-founder of Civic Hall, editor-in-chief of its new site, Civicist, and the longtime curator of Personally Democ Personal Democracy Forum. He is the author and or editor of, of numerous books on, the, on this intersection of technology and democracy, and, and I'll I mean, a, a great fan of him as well. So let's go right into it. Um, I'll leave our authors to walk us through the report. Diana, you want to take it away? Sure, thank you. Um, yes, we are all great fans of Miha. Uh, they were uh, the initiative to bring us all together along with Sasha. And this is a, a really amazing team and we're excited to share with you the results of our field scan. Um, which is, you know, looking into the potential of emerging um, technologies within the public interest. And this report carries insights into how technologists, communities, artists, researchers, and educators are harnessing emerging technologies from chatbots to robots. And we dug into what people are doing with these tools 
and what they've learned along the way. Um, what I love about this report is that it shares like so many different perspectives um, from people working on many things. And if you're someone who really likes to um, be tactile with talks, I'm going to um, put in the chat, which is our link to have the report online. So feel free to like go through that as we're talking. Um, and, you know, as we were writing this, it was pretty intense because this literally um, was during the start of the pandemic. In the midst, we had this uprising for Black liberation. There's just so much happening. Um, and the title of the report was inspired by the author, Arun Daddy Roy. And they wrote about the pandemic um, to be looked at as seen as a portal. And so, in quote, they say, it could be a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our adversary, our data banks, our dead ideas and our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with luggage ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And so emerging technologies will clearly be an important to our passage through this portal. And the big questions that we're asking is like, can we develop new tools that will allow us to live with a degree of safety from viruses? Can we ensure that technologies we develop do not unintentionally reinforce anti-Blackness or any other forms of structural inequality? And which of many potential futures do we want to build together? Thank you, Diana. So uh, good to be here. Um, a little more background on how this report came together. Um, in order to develop signposts to help guide us along this journey, Civic Hall, more than a year ago, with the generous support of the McGovern Foundation, gathered a group of researchers, technologists, and community organizers to explore the potential of emerging technologies serving the public interest. As everyone knows, there's a lot of critiques uh, well, uh, a great many of them valid and some of them uh, from some of our colleagues uh, uh, who worked on this report, uh, but we wanted to look at the potential for positive uses. For the purposes of this study, we used emerging technologies as a broad umbrella term and we shorten it as MTech, as, as you'll hear as we talk through the report. We, we paid particular attention to public interest uses of artificial intelligence in particular, machine learning, natural language processing, automated decision systems, and bots, as well as other tools, including augmented and virtual reality, drones, remote sensing, and satellite imagery. And we wanted to focus primarily on the types of MTech that would be accessible to public interest organizations. To that end, the way we worked, our team of five researchers starting last winter, developed a, a list of uh, experts that we wanted to interview. We ended up doing 24 in-depth field interviews. Those included data scientists, technologists, artists, activists, researchers, policy advocates, and others. And we also developed a database of 246 relevant uh, examples of MTech being used in the public interest. we found cause for caution and for optimism. We took all that work and we synthesized it down into seven key findings and recommendations. And we're gonna share uh, a summary of those here with you today. And we hope that these findings can provide some insight into how and under what conditions MTech can really help advance the public interest so that as we move together through the portal, we take only the baggage that we truly want and need. So the first of the principles that we synthesized from the work that we did is do no harm. And this is illustrated by uh, a quote from an interview with John Callery, who's the vice president of technology at the Trevor Project, who said, who, who told us in his interview, I think it's so easy to create a machine learning model. It's completely different to make sure that it's fair and doesn't have harmful effects. And he was sharing that thought in the context of his work at the Trevor Project on a 1.5 million US dollar Google Impact Challenge grant to develop the Trevor Project's omni-channel crisis intervention platform for LGBTQI plus youth. So the Trevor Project 
Um, if you're not familiar with their work, um, they're like a support line and support space um, for, for LGBTQI plus youth. And they're using machine learning to prioritize incoming chats and calls from young people who may be at a higher risk of suicide so that they can put those incoming chats first in the queue to reach trained counselors. And so Trevor Project used UX research to inform the development of a product that wouldn't inadvertently cause harm. Because if you're gonna be making rec you know, triage recommendations um, for people in a situation of potential self-harm, you really wanna make sure um, that, uh, that you're doing that in a way that doesn't systematically bias against some of the most at-risk youth. So particularly, you know, black and brown, indigenous, LGBTQ plus youth um, might be at greater risk here or lower income youth. So you wanna make sure your, your system's not biased against them, right? And this is important because MTech does offer great potential for mitigating and reducing harms, but we also have a vast and rapidly growing body of scholarship, practitioner knowledge, and lived experience that demonstrates that unfortunately, powerful actors too often use MTech to harm Black, Indigenous, POC, LGBTQI+, disabled, immigrant, working class, and other marginalized communities, whether or not those harms are intended, right? So it doesn't have to be intentional harm, it can still be harm. And so we therefore need widespread adoption of better design processes, independent audits, and stronger regulatory oversight. And in the full report, you're gonna find extensive recommendations for each of our key, key finding areas. And we have sections tailored for developers, funders, policymakers, and journalists, as well as cross-cutting recommendations. And so today we're not gonna share all of those with you, we'll just highlight a few. So for example, in the area of finding one, do no harm, we recommend a more robust ecosystem to minimize harms, including red teams, vulnerability bounties and independent audits to explore, test and mitigate potential and real world harms of MTech projects, both before and after launch. We recommend that people adopt the design justice network principles and explore the consentful technology guidelines. And all of those, of course, are linked in the report along with additional recommendations. Another uh, key finding is understanding that context is key. Um, and this is illustrated by um, Jagana, who is uh, an executive director, director of the localization lab. And she says, we went back to our entirely Western group of developers who worked on, which was the popular messaging app. And we said, look, there are other parts of the world. If you really design this for them, they're not using it in the same way as you thought. And there are things you might not have imagined. And it's really important to understand that each place in which we live can access or can use tech in very different ways. Um, and an emerging technology in one place or among one field or group may look so different than another. Um, so community partnerships for context and localization are essential. This was a huge finding. Um, and because there are great disparities between the countries as well as between different social sectors within each country, so in terms of technology access, adoption, or use, in some contexts, an online spreadsheet may be considered MTech, while in others, MTech might mean artificial intelligence or satellite imagery or augmented reality tool. It's very different, really, depending on where you're at and how you're using it. And so an example of context is a project that I had the honor of working on, which is the Equitable Internet Initiative launched here in Detroit, Michigan, which actually was supported through the New America Foundation and its roots. Um, and to me, it's a good example of what it looks like to offer community the skills they need to build their own internet infrastructure and in places that commercial providers had abandoned them. So the Equitable Internet Initiative worked with neighborhood leaders to ensure that more Detroit residents could have the ability to leverage the digital technologies for social and economic development. So these were areas in places that were redlined uh, by technology. So they were give, people were given the, the uh, tools that they needed to 
to overcome that. And so there's lots of recommendations from this section and as Sasha mentioned, they are definitely within um, the report. Um, but a few is, you know, like support leadership of community-based organizations and individuals with deep contextual knowledge and lived experience. This is so important. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is already out there within the More Than Code report, which in on the website, you can, um, there's a link to that. So you could be able to go through it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, everyone. So our third finding is that data is messy. And that might not be particularly surprising to those of you who've worked with data, but we mean messy in the very broad sense, not just poorly labeled. So artist and researcher Mimi Onua put it thusly, what does it mean for us to make the world into data? And what happens when we do that? And what places get missed in that process? So what Mimi is referring to here is many of the emerging technologies we talk about in this report rely heavily on data, but data is always incomplete. It's often misleading. And it's difficult to maintain and protect. Data disparities lead to amplified inequalities. So we're missing a lot of the data that we might need to actually develop technologies in the public interest. Data sets that are crucial to the work are often difficult, expensive, or just plain impossible to obtain. So for example, if you think about data about police violence or worker fatalities, you might just not be able to get that data. Not to mention, it's fundamentally impossible for data to ever fully capture the infinite range of deep complexities of human emotions, cultural significance, experiences. So we also recommend that data is not just, just isn't really an accurate proxy for reality. As an example of data being really hard to obtain, as COVID-19 spread across the US this year, a lot of states weren't sharing data on COVID-19 infections and deaths disaggregated by race. So if you wanted to do an analysis on the racial aspects of the pandemic, which turned out to be really important factors, uh, you simply couldn't. So data for Black Lives called for states to prepare and release this data. And over the course of the pandemic, they've maintained a record of which states have shared it and which haven't to try to make that data available. Oh, and lastly, um, a few recommendations on this one as well. As the report will make clear, we need significant resources to support good data stewardship. Uh, that includes that we should adopt a racial and gender equity framework specifically for data infrastructure. We should promote more transparency, consent, and accountability in how data is created, used, and shared. And we should develop mechanisms for public oversight of the use of MTech, for example, at the municipal level. Um, great. Yeah. So our fourth finding was that community-led design is for the world. Um, so Bert T here, um, a researcher from Oxford University, tells us that, you know, computer scientists are not always in dialogue with people who are social scientists or activists or anthropologists. Um, and he, he goes on to say that, you know, um, for instance, if they're looking at anti-Semitism, it would make sense that they would go and speak to people of Jewish community to read the very long and well-established literature on anti-Semitism, but normally, um, you know, when they're trying to um, design for a specific issue, they don't necessarily look at the literature that's already there, or even the people that have worked and have experienced uh, this issue. So community-led design and the fact that we need to include communities is, is really essential, and that's one of the key things that really came out. Next slide. Um, so uh, what we found uh, in our conversation with um, with our interviews is that community community led design definitely um, is 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 the way to go uh, because it provides a more just equitable and sustainable emerging tech. These practices are moving to the mainstream, so that's that's one thing that we want to appreciate. But um, in order for it to remain in the mainstream, we need more funding, training, and institutional commitment. Um, so for instance, one example um, that I am quite excited about this one particularly is, is, is an example from Mexico where um, the Human Rights Data Analysis Group worked for, um, worked for a decade to apply statistical analysis to human rights cases. Among many other powerful projects, they were able to help activists find the graves of disappeared people in Mexico City. So when you really do um, bring in the community, it makes such a difference and you do make real life impact. So some of the recommendations that that uh, stood out for us was um, that you know the importance of adopting the principle of 
nothing about us without us. So don't write about us, don't tweet about us, don't you know, uh, try to solve our problems without including us from the get-go. Um, so this is one thing that came out. Community technology practitioners, they, they have, they're within the community, they've learned most of the time um, to, to work with tech because their community needs it. Um, so they would be really um, important to learn from, partner with key stakeholders, issue experts, people with lived experiences. Um, this, these are really um, uh, important things um, that came out from, from this conversation. Um, and last but not least, adopt a human-centered policymaking approach. Um, so it's not just about the technology, but also the policy that goes into uh, making um, you know, this, this technology real and applicable in the world. Um, yeah, so the, the second one, um, the, the fifth uh, finding is uh, sometimes really snoozy is better than sexy. And this, uh, this one, I always want to tell Sasha that came up with it. <laughs> so uh, basically what we see here is that, um, um, yeah, so what we see with, uh, and with some of the interviews that we spoke with is that, um, and, and Dee has also touched upon this, is that what, you know, sometimes um, organizations need is a tool that can really help them navigate the day-to-day -day admin, uh, you know, mundane, what we might assume mundane issue, not necessarily an AI that's going to solve all their problems. They might just want a, a, you know, a, a spreadsheet with a really good script that can help them navigate, for instance, who from their fundraising um, grant making uh, group is going to potentially in, you know, fund uh, their space. Um, so these are some of the, the really critical um, things that came out. So uh, tools related with um, you know, administrative issues. Uh, <laughs> it's not blockchain. Um, it's not AI. It's not anything. It's, it's really the most simple thing that most organizations want. And you know, meeting them where they are and providing what they need is, is, is also really uh, about, about providing a, a useful emerging tech. Next slide. So one key example that we have here is, um, for example, the uh, nonprofit AI readiness checklist, um, which were written by Alison and Beth, um, we've uh, interviewed um, or some of them here as well, is they pro basically provide a checklist for um, you know, nonprofit organizations on how to navigate uh, you know, AI and how to apply AI. But in addition to providing that checklist, you know, it's also the question is, do you need this or not? Um, so if you don't, you move on and find something that works for you. Again, a spreadsheet could be the most innovative thing that, that you most likely might need here. So some of the recommendations that, that came out from, uh, from this conversation is that, uh, you know, we you know, organizations and people need support and it demonstrate and really demonstrate the capacity to implement um, um, tech for the public interest work. Um, so they need, um, it's not just about innovation hubs. It's not just about, you know, um, um, uh, what do you call them, uh, hackathons, but it's, you know, it's, it's the real capacity that, that organizations need and, you know, community um, accountability as well. So being able to meet them where they are is really important. Create and maintain a strong, regularly updated shared resource list to help navigate through the space. Um, this space quickly changed. There are new tools that are coming in. Uh, so being able, um, you know, to provide um, civil society organizations, you know, public interest organizations with this list is really critical so that they don't have to go and, you know, uh, restart from scratch. Um, last but not least, uh, do not believe the hype. Use the resources like the nonprofit AI readiness checklist and others to evaluate if your organization, you know, has the internal capacity to develop the necessary data, expertise, you know, ethical oversight and sustainability before jumping onto the bandwagon of the latest, you know, technology. Uh, consider, um, and this is, I think, my favorite one, is consider a cooperative um, for buying shared access to specialized tools. Um, so, you know, some organizations are small, they might not afford it, they don't have the expertise, so why don't we form a cooperatives um, are some of the, the things that we came up with. So on to our sixth of the seven recommendations. Uh, we also found from talking to uh, many of our expert practitioners that they really hunger for a stronger community of practice. This is a quote from Stephanie Dinkins, who is an independent artist who does a lot of cutting edge work out of her own studio uh, using tools like AI and machine learning. And she talked a lot about the value of bringing people together, the power of support, uh, and knowing that there are other folks out there to call upon um, and that, that that's a rarity and that the field would be strengthened uh, were we able to grow that. So this in particular, the recommendation is about creating more opportunities for people from historically oppressed communities to be involved and to be given access to resources 
and leadership positions. Anti-blackness specifically and diversity, equity and inclusion challenges more generally that we see in the broader tech sector also apply in the field of MTech for the public interest. And this lack of diversity is undermining the field's potential as projects too often reflect homogenous experiences of team leadership, narrow problem framing and data sets and models that reproduce existing inequalities. So we're recommending more mechanisms like conferences, dedicated fellowships using the cohort model and the creation and support of ongoing virtual and physical spaces when it becomes safe to do that again, to strengthen the growing community of people who wanna work in bringing MTech into use in public interest organizations. Um, we have a whole bunch of featured examples of the kinds of organizations working at the intersection of MTech, the public interest in racial and gender justice. I won't read the whole list to you here. Um, they're all included in our section of the Civic Tech Field Guide devoted to uh, emerging technology. So the recommendations for field building include, we have to rethink the entire pipeline uh, of how this is done. Um, one very important recommendation uh, is to support the development of MTech labs, initiatives and organizations that are specifically led by black people, indigenous people and other people of color. Um, we think there's a need in the field for a dedicated conference on MTech in the public interest. And we wanna see more support for prototypes that are being created by activists and community organizations. And so uh, last, but definitely not least, um, there was a kind of cross-cutting recommendation that applies to all of those that come before, um, which is that we need to seek strategies for institutional transformation. And so we have a quote here from Marnie Webb, who's the Chief Community Impact Officer at TechSoup, who says that nonprofits have to be actively involved in policy and development, contributing data, so that our community members and our view of the community get factored into all of those technologies. So we don't end up 10 years from now with tools making decisions without the people we serve. We really feel, and those who we talk to agree, that institutional transformation will be fundamental to effective and accountable use of MTech in the public interest. That means shifts in policies and practices within companies, within nonprofits, universities and other organizations, as well as stronger regulation at various levels of government. Unfortunately, currently, the lack of understanding of emerging technologies in all those institutional spaces, together with generational gaps in representation in policy and decision-making circles, is currently allowing tech companies to set the tone for tech oversight and use. And, you know, the scandal that's unfolded over the last week, for example, with Tim Nick Gebru, um, being fired um, as the co-lead of Google's ethics team kind of demonstrates that what happens when you allow um, tech companies to self, uh, self-govern, self-regulate in this space, right? So ultimately, we can't rely on tech companies to self-govern in the public interest. We're going to need deep institutional transformation, policy changes, and greatly expanded legal and regulatory oversight to address algorithmic harms specifically and mTech more broadly. For example, the shadow report on the NYC Automated Decision System Task Force provided really detailed recommendations for policymakers, research advocates, and public around the complexities of evaluating the true risks and opportunities of government use of ABS, the limitations of existing bureaucratic procedures, and the importance of engaging a variety of perspectives and experiences. And I apologize for the uh, background noise Zoom life and someone just started uh, cutting the grass across the street. Of course, right as I'm speaking. Um, our recommendations for this final section uh, include organizing a dedicated racial justice in tech fund that would be governed and led by Black people, Indigenous people, and other POC. Uh, the need to gather and share diversity, equity, and inclusion data about MTech programs specifically. And it's not just gathering and sharing data, that includes making public commitments to equity targets with timelines. Um, that's the best practice from the private sector, actually. 
We also think that we're not starting from scratch. There are a number of already existing policy frameworks that could help guide MTech in the public interest. And we did highlight that um, shadow report on the NYC ADS task force. We'd also like to highlight Mihente's tech policy toolkit, which they developed around the No Tech for ICE campaign. Uh, finally, well, not finally, because there are many more recs, but we also wanted to highlight um, that litigation is going to be a necessary tool for institutional transformation. And a great example of what's happening in that space is AI Now's litigating algorithms report for an overview of cases. Thanks, Sasha. Um, so in, in addition to sharing the report itself, which we want to make sure you see, it was really important to us as a research team that if we were going to spend our time and other people's time gathering all these resources that we also share those with you. And so that's why Mika and Diana pointed out um, the MTech Pathways website and uh, all of the additional resources we gathered in the process of creating this report are available as appendices on that website. So we'll drop a link in the chat um, and also in a special section of the civic tech field guide that we've dedicated to emerging technology. So uh, that section is at civictech.guide slash mtech. That link is also in the chat. And when you go to that page, you can see the hundreds of emerging tech organizations, projects, tools that you can use, conferences you can attend, fellowships you can apply for, all the resources that our brilliant interviewees shared with us. Uh, and like the rest of the Civic Tech Field Guide, this is a living collection, meaning that if it's your project that you see there, you can claim your page and you can also contribute other relevant projects to this collection. So go and check that out. Last but not least, speaking of our brilliant interviewees, uh, we don't really have time to get into uh, the detail that they shared with us, but we also published uh, edited interview transcripts with 20 of the 24, along with brief summaries. So uh, for those of the folks listening who really want to go deep in learning about how different practitioners um, use MTech in their work, think about it, how they got to where they are in the field. Uh, we really suggest you dive into those interviews. Um, the transcripts are all also uh, available at mtechpathways.org. And so we realized this is a very juicy report and that there's lots of recommendations and projects that we've highlighted here. So we hope that you take the time to explore the site. Um, and once again, mtechpathways.org. And we want to remind you that our website, um, there's also specific recommendations for journalists, developers, funders, and policymakers. Because um, we realize there's just there's still a lot of work to do, and that we all sort of have a lane to be able to do this work in, and we wanted to support people to be able to further expand that with those specific recommendations. And alongside those within our website, you'll find a slide deck for the key findings, um, similar to what we shared today. In case you want to go on and share this information with others, just please credit us. Um, a resource guide, interview summaries, as Miha said, transcripts, an annotated bibliography if you feel like really diving deep a little more into this work, and like we said, dedicated recommendations. So I want to thank you all so much um, for being here, because the first step is recognizing um, what the potential is and then gathering together to figure it out. So I'll sort of open it up to questions now. Thank you so much for, for that presentation and for the great work that you've done. It's, I've read the report and it's quite juicy as Diana said. It has a lot of information and I urge everyone uh, watching and the people that would watch it on you, that will watch it on YouTube uh, in the future to go check that, that, that site. Uh, we have some couple of questions from, from, from our audience so I'll, I'll go, uh, go through them quickly and I also have a couple of questions myself. Um, so uh, I'm not directing these at anyone specifically, so uh, I'll to our panelists, just jump in as you can. From Jim Gray, so it's, he, uh, he says, many researchers consider a wide range of data to understand a phenomenon. This could be quantitative, quantitative or qualitative. And then combine sources and formats in some way before synthesizing a conclusion. Does the panel have a particular approach to what counts as data? or how to combine various types.
Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll try a stab at this one. Um, so in terms of the methodology of this report, our data was a mix of qualitative, the 24 interviews we mentioned, but also a lot of desk research. Um, so we started with a wide collection of emerging tech projects pulled from the Civic Tech Field Guide, for example, um, that we already had a, a hundred or so emerging tech, high tech projects. And then our interviewees and the deep interviews, the qualitative stuff really fed back more quantitative data and gave us yet more examples. And you can see, we've talked about the resources, but like we're sharing all those examples with you. So you can see what we're basing these kind of uh, recommendations on, what kind of work. Yeah, and I would also add to that, um, you know, stepping back a little bit from our own report that we're talking about right now, the question of what counts as data is a really fundamental one. Um, our data is messy section really dives into that further. And I really recommend the recent work on uh, data feminism by Catherine Dignacio and Lauren Klein, because they spend a lot of time um, talking and you know, writing and thinking about um, what counts in data in different contexts. So, you know, lived experience is a type of data which is extremely important and can fundamentally reshape the way that we think about emerging technologies and what they're useful for, but often it's not taken into account um, in technology product development uh, life cycles. So there's, there's a lot to, to say about that, but I'll, I'll put the link to uh, data feminism also in the chat. Yeah, Thank to you. just add to that, um, I think that what's interesting about what Mimi shares in the report is the question of like what happens when you do start to create, turn everything into data and what's missed, um, what's highlighted. So, which is just a continual um, question. And then, you know, and how that then affects our lives and, and controls our lives through the commodification of data. So there's just like a whole lot to work with as far as figuring out how to best move forward with data in the future. Thank you. Um, I can see some of the questions are, are going through our, through our process of talking to universities as we are a university network. So I'm gonna address some here um, um, from Matt McVeigh. What roles could universities and academia play in this work? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I've just started working with Cornell Tech on their public interest technology program. And for me, the whole public interest technology movement is exciting because I've spent a lot of years in technology for social good, which is great, but it's often applying what technology it comes down the pipe from the companies and trying to use it for social good, which you know sometimes it's a win, sometimes as our report shows, it's not a win, depending how the data is being collected, for example. Uh, but with public interest tech and universities, I see next generations of technologists can be much more informed as they actually build and shape this technology itself. So instead of just using whatever comes down the pipe from Silicon Valley, we can begin to have public interest and ethics informed technologists building this from the start, aware of the issues that we talk about in this report. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Pablo Aguilera. Uh, he says, what did you identify as the greatest barriers for unders un underserved key populations to participate in tech? Maybe Diana can help us with this one. Sure. Um, it, I'll speak to specifically um, the work that I've done in Detroit, because I don't know, I don't think there's a blanket um, issue within underserved communities or a blanket solution. And here in Detroit, um, well, you know, of course, structural racism is a huge barrier. Um, but then how it plays out with redlining of neighborhoods through data, but also like dark fiber within the city, keeping a lot of this, the city without internet. Um, and then how credit and um, just the economy plays into people's access, because there was so many moments in which folks did not even have access to the internet within their neighborhoods because of the credit scores um, within their neighborhoods and the foreclosure crisis like added and perpetuated that. So just giving you a context of the sort of area in which I was working in, the greatest barrier was feeling as if they deserved or had the ability to learn technology straight up. And that I believe in light of the previous question, what the role of universities are 
I think some of it is like taking it out of the university and putting it within the community because there were so many, so much potential within the groups that I worked with, but they didn't actually feel comfortable within tech setting. So we had to remix the whole idea of a hackathon to be like a disco tech. So it's just like this community engaging space. We had to do quite a few things in order to sort of present the tech as um, it would be presented any other way on the streets. Like, like having, you know, like um, just something that folks could relate to. Um, so the very first thing was this essentially connecting people to why tech was relevant to them. So I'm going to say the greatest barrier is education, access, and honestly, the self-doubt within folks that has been perpetuated through structural racism. Um, yeah, just, just to add on to the excellent things that um, the um, said, definitely access is, is an issue for the rest of the world. But one of the things that we've noticed if we look at out of um, North America is, you know, um, majority of the world is not connected to the internet. Uh, when majority of the world is not connected to the internet and you're using, um, uh, you know, data that's, that's already out there to decide what they need while they don't exist online, um, it becomes extremely problematic. Um, there's also this idea that, you know, um, underserved communities um, only need, you know, commercial related content, not anything that that is beyond, um, you know, um, beyond that. So there's, there's a lot of issues with, you know, access, uh, digital literacy, but then specifically on content and, and language barrier as well. Uh, so we can go on and off. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely is a, is a rabbit hole to go there. I'm going to change a little bit the question uh, for uh, a question from uh, Dylan Halpern. Um, he asks, what do you think might be ways to incentivize tech companies to work with these M-Tech principles that you outlined? And how can, is there anything such as the renewable energy carbon tax here to jumpstart more responsible and inclusive data practices? Yeah, um, I'll start the, the ball. <laughs> uh, Regulation is an obvious one. And I currently live in Berlin and have noticed how much more Europe regulates on the digital front and a little more uh, in sync with where the tech is moving. Uh, the other one, you know, short of regulations is community pushback. I, we've seen in Toronto with the Stop Sidewalk campaign that communities can shut down projects that they see as not handling their data in a good way. There's also an anti-ring campaign uh, in the US for, you know, not having Amazon cameras on everybody's door. So they have like top down regulation, but you also have bottom up organizing. Perfect. Thank you. And I, I know that this, um, there's some comments in, in the chat. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask another question from Anne, Anne Arden Sonnenberg. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, do you have any educational programs or curricula to train future professionals in this area? As this is something that the, uh, the Pitt Uni University is also working on. Did you find something like that that you could share with us? Um, so in, we didn't gather uh, that specific resource in this project, um, but in the More Than Code report, there is specifically a list of educational programs and resources, and we have a link to that. Um, from within um, pathways through the portal. Thank you, and I'm shamelessly adding the work from PetU, and we are also working on building community uh, community based uh, curricula within our member universities. So please, so stay tuned for that, as we will oh, share that also, as well. Diana. Yeah, sorry. Also, um, as part of the report, which I believe is in there, is. Um, my teaching community technology handbook, which is a handbook that um, actually is specifically dedicated to folks within technology that want to teach um, to community. And it teaches you all about um, educational theories, um, how they fit into the current work of community organizing, so including pop ed and backwards design, all this stuff, and gives you templates on actually writing um, your own curriculum. So sometimes actually you all might probably are the experts as to what the tech is, but might just need some support in figuring out how to teach in an equitable way. And that book will help you. Thank you. 
Uh, one last question from the audience is from uh, Rachel Connolly. Um, she would love to know if there's a component of the report that addresses or touches on implications for educational technologies, especially those that are being used in K-12 contexts or else. I think that the answer is no, and that is an important area, extremely important area to engage. And so we'd love to learn more um, about that. If you have a resource like that, um, you could share it out with the hashtag MTech Pathways, which uh, we're using across social media to generate conversation. Um, it looks like Mika has another, another resource. Yeah, I was just going to say it's an excellent question, and it was beyond the scope of our study, um, because what we really wanted to focus on was um, the expectation uh, that uh, there were all these great tools that public interest organizations could start using, public interest organizations being the operative actor. Um, it's true that teachers, schools are in effect public interest organizations, but it's a whole other sector. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of the same concerns and, and patterns that we found uh, uh, about hype and, uh, and about reinforcing um, uh, patterns of discrimination and about uh, you know, surveillance capitalism basically cropping up in the educational field. Um, but we really, what, what we were imagining is at, at the end of this, for people who want to go into the field of developing this kind of technology, what are some important guideposts? And then also for people who work, say, at a nonprofit organization that is focused on some kind of public good, um, what are examples where we see meaningful uses of mTech uh, that we think are positive uh, or tools? Um, you know, we one very big gap in this field right now is that there is not a really trusted third party evaluator um, of the, the technologies that are on offer. So, for example, there may be a great tool uh, that you can use to simplify transcription of interviews. Um, but, you know, is that tool really uh, uh, secure? Is it really, you know, uh, keeping your data private, et cetera, et cetera? Um, that's a gap in the field that needs to be filled. Thank you, Monica. Uh, Miha, sorry. Um, so last question from Hilda in England. What would the panel say is the role of artists and creative folks in helping advance the world of developing equi e e equitable, beneficial and tech? You've already shared one great story. I'm very excited about this question and thank you for bringing um, into the conversation the role of artists because they often get overlooked um, and i believe that you know the thing that art does that um no other thing i believe can do as well is that it allows us to investigate um and present other perspectives um without the sort of pull of politics or the pull of um, relationships, it's just like objects, these objects can just hold so much and then trigger things within us to think completely differently, which I think is very, very powerful. Um, and then when you put technology into that in, in the hands of artists, they start to discover things that we might not be looking for. So in talking to Stephanie Dinkins, um, she was like really, um, interesting because she was saying, you know, she's a self-taught machine uh, learner, artificial intelligence programmer. Um, and her whole thing was when she saw a robot that uh, was prototyped as a black woman, she wanted to talk to them, understand why a black woman, if, you know, and as she was talking to them, she was like, this, this woman is not black. Um, and then started thinking about the, the, the information that's required to share blackness within technology um, and how colloquial that is and how connected to culture that is and how um, it's different, you know, and, uh, and, and depending on where you're at. So she began then really looking into um, data and uh, around identity. And I don't think 
that emerged in the other place outside of her work, which I, I think is super fascinating. And then also Mimi, um, who is looking at data sets and thinking, um, like some of her most known work is that um, there's just simply data sets missing of, of people who, um, and you know, who, who if, they're, if it's missing, do they exist, you know? And so she created like a whole uh, set of um, files of, of missing data sets and there's physical evidence of the sort of blindness that um, we've had. So, you know, art does a really special thing where it allows us to it investigates in a way that um, I don't think any other medium can. And so that's a long way of saying that I think artists have the ability to sort of push the boundaries of this M tech and then take it someplace further. Um, and so it's really important for us to include these uh, artists as a part of um, the cohort that we spoke with. Um, and yeah, that's all. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Diana. I want to close out this uh, our conversation with a question addressed to all of you, and it's a little a, a little on the personal side, but I mean, most policymakers have serious constraints on their side when they're trying to implement new technologies, so they have limited resources. What recommendation would you personally think should be prioritized, or the one that spoke the most to you, or, or acted as a surprise for you when when you went to the research? So if I could jump in first, uh, oh, go ahead, I would just say um, slow down. Uh, the the uh, the amount of hype and expectation about the magical power of technology um, has uh, it, it's everywhere, and so the very first thing is um, do not rush uh, into this. The mistakes that have been made to date are largely because of hype uh, powered by VC money. Um, and in some cases, uh, foundation program officers uh, who also wanted to show something off. The shiny, bright new thing is often not what you think it is. So I would say number one, slow down. Thank you. Uh, Matt, what would be the, the one that the most spoke to you? Yeah, it's related to me because uh, snoozy over sexy is definitely something I think applies to the public sector and policymakers in general. I know a lot of people inside government that would much rather have like cell phone data um, coverage in their office more than some crazy new AI feature or cloud collaborative document writing instead of some crazy new VR feature, right? Um, so sometimes that means working with the IT departments that people try to do end runs around. Uh, but I think a lot, if we're thinking this the net public good, I think some of the not bleeding edge technology has the most potential. Thank you. What about you, Burhan? I would say believe uh, people, not technology. Uh, we've seen, you know, over and over again, governments rushing to um, to imp employ a specific technology, um, you know, lock people out. Um, I mean, here where I'm sitting out of Kenya, like the government has collected 30 million people's biometric data without defining how they're going to use it just because um, you know some private company has pushed in that direction for instance um, so believe people not technology and invest in people not in technology that sounds perfect Sasha what, what will be yours um, it's a tough to choose just one um, but I think that the um, scandal with uh, Timnit at Google last week um, really brings home for me the importance of stronger regulatory oversight um, to develop accountability. And I think that that needs to happen at multiple levels. So, you know, municip municipalities um, have been passing bills, for example, to block the use of uh, face surveillance by law enforcement. Um, we have a federal bill um, around FRTs and biometrics. Um, that there may be some chance of actually having bipartisan support for and, and getting through with the new administration. But we're going to need a lot more than that. I think bringing back the Office of Technology Assessment um, is a proposal that's been floating and that would be a key mechanism to help us um, develop stronger um, leadership and oversight on the regulatory side. 
um, we're going to need that as we as we go go forward with these tools. Thank you. Again, last but not least, Diana, what do you think? What what, what was the one that spoke for you strongest? Um, you know, I I think as far as this question goes to the policymakers, um, I would say like uh, quit passing the torch. Like this is all on you. Like we need to, we need these regulations. We need these. It's very clear how uh, important the role policy plays in the future of technology after doing this report, also after reading, you know, just a lot about the role data plays within our economy. Um, so I say, if you have not enough resources to educate yourself um, so that you could tell, talk to your colleagues about doing this, one of the biggest lack of um, the things that I found is that people just don't know what's what the stuff is um and it's not like policymakers are techies or vice versa um and until we have that sort of beautiful hybrid of a person in power we're going to be sort of stuck so i say you know don't pass the torch and get let's get onto it with it we need regulation and we need oversight well with that uh, being the last thing to said, I am going to close this off and thank you so much. Thank you all to our panelists for, for not just the work that you've done, but also taking a, an hour of your time to, to talk about this uh, amazing process. And I urge every attendee and every people watching on YouTube later to um, check this report. Uh, again, is uh, you can you can check it out at uh, mtechpathways.org and on all of the, uh, all of the links that we've been sharing uh, through the through the um, to the chat so again thank you all and have a great rest of the year <laughs>